Hey, my name is Pastor Sunil, and welcome to our archive messages. You can join us on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. in person, or catch us live online. We hope that you're truly blessed by this message, and once again, thanks for tuning in. We, um, we've been doing this series on, on uh, generosity, and when I was first thinking of when to do it, and I like to tie anything, everything in, my staff would probably laugh, because I'm always trying to figure out how to tie something in. But um, when I was thinking of, of this series, I right away put this message on, on this day, because this is Pentecost Sunday. You might see it on some signs when you drive around. And, uh, and one of the things that you probably think of in Pentecost Sunday, and, and, and many times when people, uh, if they will, label a group of individuals, when we are labeled as Pentecostals, we, we think of some of uh, Acts chapter 2, and, and rightly so, uh, we think of Acts chapter 2. But when people look at the book of Acts, or think of Acts chapter 2, they're thinking of, of some of the manifestation aspects of, of Pentecost, which rightly so, very true characteristics, but I, I think we miss it when we miss the part of Pentecost that we'll be talking about today. The Pentecost Sunday, I think we should be and we should never uh, describe or see the New Testament church, especially that one that, that branched out of Jerusalem after the revival and the Pentecost, the moving God in the upper room. You cannot miss the fact that the generosity that was happening, not only spiritual kingdom, God adding to the church thousands every day, but also how freely they were with what they had, how quickly they gave. It was a mark of the Pentecost. It was a mark of, I believe, not just what God was doing in Acts chapter 2, but what God was doing from years past as a feast of Pentecost, which is actually one of the feasts. So we're going to be looking today, not only at God is a, a learning about generosity, but remembering what we got, our first fruits. There was a combination of, of three feasts, uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of, of Pentecost, uh, the Feast of uh, First Fruits, and the Feast of Pentecost, or the Feast of Weeks. And so we're going to kind of be capturing that today. If you want to turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 9 to 17. Here's why I believe that we've, and, and if you've been coming here for a while, or you've been probably coming here for longer than I have, because we've been here for just almost three years, you'll know this is the most I have ever talked about giving in church. And, um, but I do believe it's important for us as a family to talk about giving and talk about being generous. So in this series of messages, we have a few more left, and uh, we have one coming up, Remembering the Poor, a key part of generosity next week, and then uh, we're going to remember our generous father, and we have a gift for fathers on Father's Day. And then a final message that's summing it all up, uh, being intentionally, again, uh, genero- generous at the end of June. And then we start a new series um, on God's way or our way. And we're looking at some key individuals in Scripture, um, people like uh, David or Abraham or Solomon or Saul, that they had God's plan for their life their way and God's plan for their life God's way. And so we're doing that over our summer, looking forward to that series. Unless we are diligent, we naturally have a hard time giving to God. And this is why we need to talk about it. Because if we don't talk about it, your default is not give. Now, now some of you may give for whatever reasons or motivations. The truth of the matter is, if we are not intentional and mark things in our life to say, I am going to put God first... If you don't do that, he won't be. And that's just a a tendency. One of my friends is a fisherman said, and I'm going to use him later on in illustration. He he came up to me and said, I got a word for you. And I like fishing, but uh, uh, um, whenever I get a particularly stressful week, it usually Val says to me, I think you need to go fishing. That's usually my, my outlet. I've said it more than once. Oh, I need to go fishing as I run to the photocopier when it's not working or something. But um, when, when uh, he was, he said, I got a word for you. I said, oh, yeah? And he goes, only dead fish go with the flow. I said, well, that's a good one. Unless we're diligent, it takes work, it takes intention, it takes fight to be able to swim against a current. And if you do not set God first in practical areas of your life, you will find yourself going with the flow of a sinful nature. Making yourself the priority. No other thing in life touches 
all of us except God himself than money. It can be used for good or evil. Jesus, when he spoke about parables, 17 of the 36 parables that Jesus spoke were about money and possessions. It's almost half. There's not even a close second when it comes to topics. It's one thing when those who do, know, do not know Christ or fall in his ways have a bad attitude about money or, or a bad attitude about giving, but it's another thing for the people that know God have the same or get in a huff when we talk about it. Now, I, I tend, and I've already said this before, I have a hard time, I don't like a big push or a big pull uh, in giving, giving out a crisis or, or giving out a pressure. It, it just is counterintuitive to the messages we're doing. We, we don't give out of those reasons. We give because we just give to God out of generosity. And so I, I don't really, and especially on that offering time when we do, I give you an opportunity to serve and worship God that way, but I don't do it in a way that coerces or tries to to pressure you in any way. The principle that most Christians agree that we, we need to do something for God and we need to be obedient to God, but when it comes to the area of giving of, of, of money, we have a hard time. Uh, last week, and I appreciate you in the middle of the message, when I all of a sudden, just kind of on a whim, we had a pastor that was here from up north in Kirkland Lake, and, and uh, we were talking about giving him a handshake, a little bit of money in it, and a number of you responded to that. Thank you. I got a text from him. Didn't tell me amount or anything, but he just said, your people were very generous with me. I felt like a, you know, a, a parent that got a good parent-teacher report. You know, you just kind of, that's good. I'm really glad. There was one individual who came up to me and said, Pastor, when, as soon as you said that, he was there, I felt like I should bless him. And then when you said that we should do it in the middle of your message... Well, then I, even more, I thought, well, now I've got to do something. He said, so they, they reached in and got some cash, and uh, they were going to shake his hand and give him that cash. Said, as soon as I did it, they said to me, this is after service, they said, as soon as I did it, it was like God said, double it. I thought, well, you know, whatever. It's just a crazy thought. Too much pizza. And they left it, but it wouldn't go away. It's like a little more intensity in the voice. Double it. I kept thinking about it, double it. I'm thinking about it. As great as my message was after that point, they could only hear this voice, double it, right? So then eventually they, it did not go away and they did not get a, an ease at all until they kind of reached in and, and doubled it. They said, thank you so much. It's just so freaky they said about how, how I was thinking about doing something and then you said it and then, it, and then doubled it. I said, that's, that's God speaking to you. That just doesn't happen when a pastor's got a mic and he's up on a platform and, and there's slides and, it, it, and you're around people and, and it, this just doesn't happen after the pastor preaches on generosity. That's, that's the heart of God wanting to be generous to people and he speaks to people so they will be generous on his behalf. That's how it works. And just as nonchalant as that, just as, as simple and as natural, my dad often says, the, natural, the supernatural is best done naturally. It's not in a great big hoopla. It's just as simple as just thinking about somebody and thinking of what you can share and, and giving it. Giving is something that's the heart of God. We shouldn't do it with hesitation, but with with openness and excitement. Israel, as through its course of its life as God's people, on more than one occasion, there were times when they had a hard time giving or remembering God. And they also learned that not only is it hard to give to God, but it is harder not to give. God takes seriously what we do with what we have. And very clear, I penned this because, well, typed it, penned it. But it's true. We cannot honor God with our words and not with our wallet. Now, I know you sound to me, it sounds like one of these TV evangelists or something is trying to get. It's just the truth in Scripture. The Feast of Pentecost is an Old Testament celebration of the harvest and giving God the best. Is actually, like I said, one of three. It's also called the Feast of Weeks. There were seven feasts 
the times when, when God's people were called to get together and for a specific theme and a purpose. Three of the seven were required attendance. You couldn't skip out on these. These three, Feast of Pentecost, was one of these three musts. It was a time of first fruits, like the video was saying. Giving God, not after you've had a chance to build up a little bit of a nest egg and then giving, but giving God of the first when there's no guarantee of anything to follow, but you trust. The reason why it's called Pentecost, pent, is for 50 And so it's 50 days after the Passover. Celebration of harvest and giving God the best. The best grain. Giving the best, the first, before you kept anything for yourself. Why was this so important for God? And in all the seven feasts, had a very important reason. One to remember how he brought them out of Egypt. Why, Why this? Why is it so important To give God your first. Important enough to make sure it is done every year. Regularly. Well, obviously, like we've seen, it's no different today than it was then. The great struggles to give and to remember God. To put our faith and trust in Him. Our sinful nature tries to hold on to everything we have for ourselves. We calculate everything. We even can dip this selfishness in righteous reasons. We give, saying we give, but we give to get credit. We give to give recognition. It's the, it's the way in which the, the sinful nature, the old self, the way that we live with, by just floating with the flow, just thinking about everything and how it affects us and prioritizing by us first, even when we start moving towards the way God would have us to move in a way that puts him and others first, it always still tries to creep in, spoil the batch. We do things not because it is right and because we put God first, but because we want to get credit. Giving is a fundamental part of belonging to Christ, but it's not just giving or being generous. It's being selflessly giving it's it's faith giving putting our trust in him recognizing i don't own all things what i have is not mine it's his it's also a way of expressing gratitude we'll see this very clearly in our text now we're going to verse 9 and verse uh, in chapter 16 of deuteronomy if you want to turn if you start on the left you'll get there real quick just one book and you'll get one deuteronomy Riches, or looking at our plenty or our abundance. At the time of Passover, the very first sheaf of barley was waved, and 50 days later, at Pentecost, the full harvest came in. Look at this, verse 9. Count off seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the standing grain. People would go out in their fields, ripening grain with their sickles. And cut down a certain amount of barley. Bundle it up into a sheaf. Now, how many know what a a sheaf is? You know what a sheaf? How many ever seen stooking grain? How many seen, like, I'm just thinking, my dad one time got so freaked out in the church he was passionate, he didn't know what stooking grain is. The next week, great big tarp and grain on the platform. The, the, uh, The church custodian wasn't too pleased, I don't think. But he, he proceeded to show uh, what it means to stoop grain. And you take a sheave of grain, which is a, made up of many stalks of grain and tied together. And, and that's the sheath. You see like almost tied in the middle and it kind of sprouts out like an hourglass. And you get a, two, two sheaves of grain and you stoop them by leaning them against one another. Usually, you know, by four or even amount. You get two like this and then two like this. And that helps them dry out. I remember my grandfather stooking grain when I was a young boy just to show us what it was like. Nowadays, you see, they rake it up in the middle. They have all kinds of different ways. But what's key is at the beginning of the harvest, they would go out, they would bundle one before they even start stooking it, before they even finish, before they start making bread. They take one, they bundle it up, and they bring it. No one partakes of the harvest until the first fruits are offered. 
they would, along with the priests and the elders, would march in a procession up to the temple with great rejoicing. Now, this is rejoicing before the fall harvest has come in. This is the first one, and they're rejoicing. They don't know what it's like. Nowadays, you drive a combine. I mean, they can tell you everything. It can tell you how much moisture is in the stuff you're taking. It tells you how full the bin is behind you. It can tell you the yields you got. It can guide everything. It's unbelievable, the combines now. I mean, they have combines now. When you're traveling along, it can tell you exactly, maps the whole thing out, hooks up the GPS. It's unbelievable. I love it. My little, like, geek tech stuff. I like sitting in there partly for the harvest and, the, and, and partly for just the farming part of it, the agriculture part of it, but also for the, the technological part of it. It's amazing. By the end of it, they know pretty well what the percentage of, of moisture in it, which is affects the cost that you're gonna, the price you're going to get for it, if the yield that you're getting for every per acre. It's, it's unbelievable. This was before they had the numbers in. This wasn't how much have we got, okay, now we'll give. This was first bunch. Wrapped up, that's it. And they're already giving thanks and rejoicing. They would turn their sheaf of barley over to the priest who would wave it as a wave offering. We, we sometimes talk about wave offering, put our hands in there, but it would take up the sheaf, the first roots, and wave it before God as a wave offering. And it was great rejoicing when they would wave this wave offering. Giving thanks for the harvest before it's come in. That's a huge, huge principle. Don't miss this one. This was giving thanks, not after your, your wheelbarrow's fallen over, after it's coming out of the top of your barn. This is giving thanks for the harvest before it's come in. God wanted the first fruits then, and he wants the first fruits now. Just as a little side note, we're going to have the conclusion of the service, a time of communion and remembering of what God has done for us through Christ. The day Jesus rose was the first fruits of all who one day would rise again. Isn't that interesting? I mean, Paul even says, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of all who have fallen asleep. He's saying he was, he was the beginning. Now, that time has not come yet, obviously, but he was the first one to be presented to, to God. As resurrected, the first of many. It's a time of huge celebration, not only to receive from the harvest, but a celebration to be able to give the best. This is so important, I believe, to God's people because, see, other nations had used what they had for themselves, and, and, and it became societies of corruption and wealth and, and, and power struggles. God wanted his people to be guarded against this. So he set into place in the very beginning a pattern of remembering they don't own everything and that the first belongs to God and put their faith and trust in him and never forget that. By giving, they would never forget that they don't own everything and that God is the one that supplies our needs. Taking without giving destroys a nation. And destroys a person. This is a this principle of first fruits is is all great when you hear it until it until it impacts you personally. I had a, this friend, the fisherman friend, when I would go out fishing with him, I'll never forget the first time we were out fishing in, in a type of fishing that I hadn't never done before, and and, uh, and and we were out one time one day and and uh, we caught a fish and oh awesome we got one. Put it in the bowl because you're never sure, right? How many are catchermen? How many are catchermen? Well, the difference is when you're a fisherman, you can go fishing and not catch anything and still have a good day because you're a fisherman. But if you're a catcherman, you go fishing and you don't get one, it is not a good day. You are a catcherman. It's the difference between a, a buying person and a shopper. If you're a buyer... You go out shopping, if you don't get anything, you're not happy. But if you're a shopper, you can shop all day. Come home, not buy anything, and be completely happy. So I'm a fisherman, but I like catching. I can go fishing all day, not catch anything, but still have a good day. 
we were out there, but when you get one, it's bonus. It's blessing, right? I'm thinking our kids love to eat fish, and I love to cook it, and I love to eat it. So we were out fishing, get the first one, nice size, a real beauty, and unhook it, and I'm like, what? He goes, first one goes back. Back in the water. Really? Yep. Thank you, Lord. God provided that one. He'll provide more. Back in the water. I'm like, wow. Wow, that's amazing. Catch a nice big fish and you put it back. The next day, guess who caught the first fish? Me. I catch it. I'm getting the hook off. It says, put it back. See, the problem is I'm in his boat. <laughs> it's boat rules. It was all fine. I thought, wow, what a nice gesture that you put that one back. And thank God, it is a rule. First one goes back. Now, it was one thing when it was him giving his first. But when all of a sudden I had to give my first, I was like, ooh. ooh, ooh. I mean, you could go the rest of the day and not catch anything. It's a challenging principle when it affects you. There are two seas in the same country talking about fishing. Two seas in the same country of Israel. They're both fed from the same source, but vastly different. One, Sea of Galilee. We've heard about this. This is where the disciples were on the shore working on their nets. This is where they pulled in a bounty so big that it almost sank their boat. This is, this is a beautiful, beautiful, life-giving body of water. Vegetation all around it, trees on its, on its shores, commerce, waterway, people coming and going, fresh and full, giving away what it receives, life. Streams that flow into it, and life flew, flowed from it. The other sea, fed from the same source, the Dead Sea. Unlike the Sea of Galilee, nothing grows in it. It's dead. I've been in the Dead Sea. For those that have ever been to Israel, we had a chance to be there. It is so full of salt that nothing can live in it. You can actually sit in the water and read a newspaper. It's so full. They've got not, it looks like snow drifts on the shores, but it's actually deposits of salt. Nothing lives in it. No life, no, vegetate, no vegetation, nothing grows. The only difference between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea is the Sea of Galilee passes on what it receives. Receives fresh water, receives life, and passes on life. But like a swamp, like something that is dead, it, the Dead Sea receives what is life, but nothing is passed on. It only takes responsibility. The people of God were asked to give a free will offering in proportion to the blessings God had given them. Free will offering. You think, wait a minute, I thought this free will thing is supposed to be New Testament. I can give away whatever I want. But that's actually in the Old Testament too. Yeah. Verse 10. Then celebrate the festival of the weeks, Pentecost. To the Lord your God, by giving a free will offering in proportion to the blessings the Lord your God has given you. Now, what would be harder, what would be easier on a Pentecost Sunday would be to talk about maybe some of the physical manifestations of Acts chapter 2, and we could certainly do that. I believe it would be a great challenge in Pentecostal churches today, not just Pentecostal churches, in churches in general today, if we applied this principle to honor Pentecost. How about for Pentecost, everybody comes with a special readiness to give, in proportion of what God has given them, a free will offering. Everyone roll their eyes and go, here he is again, a preacher talking about money. Then celebrate the festival of weeks with a free will offering. After the first fruits, the harvesting began. It took seven weeks to do the harvesting. After this first one was collected, then they offered it and went back to collecting. 
After all the collecting was done, there was a great feast to acknowledge the first fruits. The full harvest now. Now you had the first one, the first, the harvest. And now at the beginning of, of applying the harvest, once the full harvest comes in, you come and give at the beginning an expression of what was provided. At the beginning, you celebrate what will come in, and when it comes in, you at the beginning of it coming in, at the beginning of you applying what came in, you also celebrate with a gift. At Pentecost, free will offering. No percentage is given here. This is not tithing. This is just a free will offering in proportion of what, how God has blessed you. Now that you've seen, here you gave the one in faith to believe that God's going to give a harvest. And now that you've seen the harvest, and the harvest has come in, and you've calculated how God has blessed you, you honor him in proportion of how he's blessed you. That's Pentecost. The harvest had been bountiful. And if it was, the gift should reflect that. Discovered by in their giving, they would in turn be even more enriched. Giving would not impoverish them. It would enrich in them. They would see God at work. Again, that they do not own this, but that they have, not because they were better farmers than the next person, or they have, not because they have better land, or they're a better person, or they're better at managing. They have because God has blessed. And they recognize that. I read a story about a priest once asking one of his parishioners to serve as a financial chairman. The man was a manager of a grain elevator, he said, I would do it under two, con two conditions. The first condition is that no report would have to be given for a year. And after a year, I'll give a report on the finances of the church. Second of all, that no one can ask any questions about it until the report. The pastor goes, sure, whatever. I can't get anybody else to say yes to it, so it's yours. At the end of the year, he made his report. Paid off the church debt, 200000 redecorated the church, gave him extra money to missions, and put $5,000 in the bank. The priest asked, how did you do all this? And the congregation were equally asking, that's incredible. How did you do this? He said, I didn't. We did. So what do you mean we did? Well, he says, you people keep bringing your grain to my elevator. As you did business with me, I simply withheld 10% and gave it to the church, and you never missed it. <laughs> Their giving was not the leftovers. It was the first fruits, and it was the best. Pentecost was about giving the first fruits, not giving what someone could afford or giving after they've figured out what they can, sh what they can spare. Reveling. Don't miss the attitude that's in this. When you read verses 11, verse 13, verse 14, 15, in there, is, it's laced with words like rejoice, celebrate, be joyful. They're actually extreme joyful words, like being ecstatic, being expressive with your joy. Your joy will be complete, maxed joy and celebration. God's people giving is a joyful thing, not a ne ne negative thing. There's something wrong when, when people who have received greatly are frustrated with giving. The New Testament talks about this, 2 Corinthians 9, referred to this a couple times in the series. Each should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. God loves a cheerful giver. God is not just asking us to give so that he won't be mad at us. I'm going to give so I can, I can just be okay. I, I don't, I'm not going to get in trouble. He's not asking us to give just out of obligation, but out of privilege. When we give, we participate in the divine. In the same way as when we love, and because God is love, and when we love uns unselfishly and putting others first, we participate in the divine nature of God because God is love. And so when we give generously, not out of compulsion, not because it's pulled out of us, but just out of an expression, when we initiate giving, 
We participate in the divine. God, we love him because he first loved us. We, we freely give because we have received. He initiates generosity. He's the first one to step out, looking for an opportunity to hand out. And when we look for the raised ready to put our hand out, to bless, to help, to come alongside, we participate in the divine. That is a privilege. That's not an obligation. For those you've been a part of this, you know what I'm talking about. The fulfillment that comes when you put someone else first. It's not why you do it, but there is a, a blessing, a, a sweet smell in our spirit when, we, when we're part of the divine. It just is like breathing the northern air after a five-hour drive to the cottage. You just kind of go, Whew. The emphasis in the text is actually much more on the attitude of joy and the celebration than it even, even is on the giving. It's like the focus is the giving and the, the, the focus is the joy. And, and to facilitate the joy and the great celebration, the, the giving is a means to the end, joy. When we look at these, we make, joy, we make giving the focus. It's, it's not. It's, it's the celebration and the joy. Abundant harvest is being celebrated. A God who gives abundantly being celebrated. Spiritual dynamic to material things. An attitude toward the material blessing brought a focus on God and a blessing spiritually. Ranging. Don't miss as well of who's involved in this giving of gifts. Verse 11, 12, and 14. It's all encompassing. Notice who participates. You, your sons and daughters, your men servants and your maid servants, the Levites, the aliens, the fatherless, and the widows. Everybody. Everybody participates in this giving. From Levites, from God's people, to the aliens, to those that don't have the orphans, the widows. Usually, the orphans and the widows are on the side of receiving. In this, they have a privilege of participating in the divine. Everybody. Joy. Selflessness. Everyone has something to give. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt. He reminds them to help them to give. Everybody. Reminding them a time when they all had nothing. I've been talking about the comparison between prosperity giving, legalistic giving, and transformational giving. Prosperity says you give, when you have a lot, you give a lot, and so if you give a lot, you're going to get more, and there's this kind of rich get richer approach to it. I mean, you, 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 the more you give, God's going to bless you 10 times, 100 times, whatever. You sow a seed, you'll get it, so you sow more seeds, you're going to get more. Prosperity focus on, I give so I can get more. Legalism says, I, I, I give so I can get a tax deduction. I give and so uh, I want to make sure I, I get those receipts done and get everything out so I can maximize the amount. And, and I'm going to give so I can maximize my giving. Well, what about if you're asked or there's an opportunity for you to give beyond what is your maximum allowable to declare on taxes? Would you still give? And then there's transformational giving. It's, it's giving because the reward is not for you. The reward is not in your taxes. The reward is kingdom rewards. Eternal rewards. Ones you may not see now. We should not forget who blessed us, where the blessing came from. No one is exempt from being a giver. Notice it says, the Levites. So this is a gift that comes, and particularly the Levite gift. Well, where do they get? I mean, 
they're not farmers. The priests, the priests are not farmers. They serve in the temple. They, they feed the people spiritually. The people are supposed to come and bring their tithes and bring their offerings to, to the storehouse, to the temple, as, as they do kingdom work. Here you have Levites who have received because people have given to the work of God. But even though they've given to the work of God and the Levites received, they still are required themselves to give to the work of God. Giving is something that's level ground for all people. I gotta say here, and I've said this before, but and I'm, I make this, I have this conversation usually all the time with young pastors whenever I have an intern or, or a young minister and I have an opportunity to bless and to talk about the things of God. I'm very, very clear with my passion about those who serve God in a way, in the privilege of being a pastor, that they keep as a priority being generous and giving to the work of God. It is, it is humbling that you receive because people give to God. It is incredibly humbling to know that, that, that I receive. I have food on my table because people give to the work of the Lord. God requested his people give a tithe to the Levites to be used in the house of God, providing for God's people, help the poor and the needy. He actually goes so far to say in Malachi that when they don't, they're robbing not the priests, but they're robbing God. <laughs> I had one time, I won't say where, but one situation, a few people were unhappy with the decisions in the church, and that happens. I said this to the one, uh, usually there, there's some funny statistics where 15% um, of the people in the church you pastor don't like you because of the decisions you made. Another 15% don't like you because of the decisions you didn't make. And 15% and like the guy before you. And they'll like you when you're gone, but just right now, they like him or her. So it's, it happens. And, and people don't like decisions you make or didn't make. For whatever reason, a few individuals in the church were upset. And I, I was oblivious to what, their, what they had um, decided to do in, uh, with their upsetness. Uh, I only found out because someone else came to me and said, Pastor, we've been away for a few weeks and we really feel bad. Uh, we didn't have a chance to give in the offering. I just wanted to make sure that you know that we're not a part of the boycott. I'm like, what? Well, the, 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 the giving boycott. I'm like, the, the what? And then I had one of those that involved in counting the offerings. I really don't look. I mean, I'm not sitting there. I'm not part of the counting. We have a very clear, and if you want to see it, I'd be happy to show you because we've gone through a lot of time of putting it together, financial policies and how offerings, accountability, how things are counted, how things are processed. It's very, very, uh, we try to keep it as, as, as accountable as possible. But what was happening is I had some guys that were involved in the counting, and the counting team come to me and said, Pastor, we're getting a few checks that are, that are $1 checks. So a couple of individuals were doing, apparently. They were wanting to express their unhappiness with things by, by putting in the offering a $1 check. What do we do with it, Pastor? I said, cash in. I mean, I, what else are we going to do? What they didn't realize is, I, I, I mean, I didn't come up with the idea. This is not my idea. When, if you decide to withhold from giving to God and you're a believer and a follower of Christ, that, that's up to you. That's between you and God. When they withheld from giving to the priests, they were robbing God. Now that I say that, many we've heard that and you're sitting there saying, yeah, pastor, we've heard that sermon before. How many times have you heard the sermon? If it is robbing for God, from God, when you receive from wherever you work, from GM, from the teachers, wherever you work, from the board of education, 
If it's robbing from God when you receive from these employers and don't give to the work of the Lord, how much more is it robbing from God if you receive from people who give to the work of the Lord and don't give to the work of the Lord? How much more? See, I believe there's a great responsibility to those who receive from the work of God and don't give to the kingdom. That goes for the individual, a pastor, or that goes for the church. Lord, have mercy on the church who receives offerings and just holds them to do what they do to build a kingdom, to build a little empire, rather than recognizing we receive so that we have an opportunity to give and be a part of what God's doing in the kingdom. What's true for the individual is true for the institution. We need to give. And I am I'm not in a in a haughty way, but I am pleased to say that when we sit down as a, as a leadership to go over our finances, a very important integral part of our finances is what are we going to do in the kingdom that has nothing to do with what benefits us here on this site or any of our programs, but just how are we going to be generous and putting the generosity at the front end with what we receive whether it's supporting missionaries all around the world, whether it's supporting local pastors, we have in our budget opportunities to to give towards pastors and churches in our area that don't result in all. Not a guy coming to preach here, nothing, no recognition even. Just being a part of building the kingdom, not a kingdom. Why? Because I believe it is the biblical way. So we strive to be a church that not only tells you to give, but we strive to be a leadership that leads in giving this way. I totally messed all my notes, didn't even follow any of them, just kept on going. So I'm going to keep on moving. Move to the next point because I just went, Um, okay, recalculating. Recognition. Deuteronomy 16, 16, we're going to wrap it up. God wanted his children to enjoy the abundance he gave them, but he also wanted them to take action to give recognition of where it came from. You know, when you recognize that you didn't, it's not yours, it's someone else's, it's, uh, it changes the way you see things, the way you give. And I, I'm hesitant, I almost didn't, a couple of weeks ago, I almost shared this, and I, I, I pulled the punch a little bit because I was uncertain whether to do it. I didn't want to be taken wrong, and I hadn't talked to the individual, but... I talked to him just recently, and he said, go ahead, share it. And I'm all awkward as well because I was involved in it, and I'm not trying to get personal credit for it, but it just fits this illustration so well. Out of a strange reason, we had sold a van that I can't believe the guy is even going to drive, but anyways, as is, and he came and picked it up, and it was on its last legs. The doors wouldn't open. I mean, the mechanic told me how much it was going to cost, and I was like, there's no way. It's done. And so it was around Christmas time, and, and so he paid cash, and so I had cash and he paid in 50s so I had we, we paid off you know put some in the bank and I gave some in the offering and and so because I had this cash and so I thought well and I, and I had a few left over 50s and so I I like pastor with pastor Jason yes I gave a bless couple blessings and um, just you know Pentecostal handshakes to call them just you know blessing somebody put a little bit of money in the hand and um, I enjoy doing that and that's but and I've done that before but so it's but what was unique this time is that I, uh, Pastor Call was going to a youth pastor's, um, a youth pastor's meeting in Niagara Falls. All the young pastors were all meeting together for a few days of ministry. And uh, when that was the case, I was in my office. It was one of the last days. It was the, I, I believe, I can't remember where it was. But I remember the thought, yeah, I heard him talking. I think it was in the hall or I think it was in the office. I can't remember where it was. He could probably tell you. But I remember him speaking and just talking, as you can sometimes in the office, you can hear other people having conversations. And as I heard him speaking, I had, I had one more left, because this is like June, July, um, January, like 15th or so. It was like middle of January. So I had one more 50 left in my back pocket. So I thought, give it to him. Have him give it to a young pastor. Thought crossed my mind. I was like, that's kind of, he's going to feel weird about that. But I said, ah, whatever. So I walked up to him and chased him down. And he knows how much I, I, I like to bless pastors of churches or uh, bless other churches, smaller, bigger, whatever, and be a blessing to churches. And so I thought, you know, he'll get it. So I went up to him. I said, here's 50 bucks. And uh, 
when you're going down the, this week, it was a Monday, uh, end of Sunday and Monday, Tuesday. And I said, uh, just find a pastor. God will lead you and just bless him. Put it in his pocket. And so he went down uh, to the, and, and afterwards he, he got back to me. He says, you know, it's amazing. He said, amazing how it changed the way I, I talk about expectations. So it made me think of it today again, Call, when you were talking. So it changed how I experienced that week. Because from the very beginning, I wasn't just there to receive, be blessed, to hear teaching, to worship. He said, I was, my mind was thinking about who am I, who am I going to give this to? Suddenly now, because he had this gift, he's now processing things in a process of, of giving rather than just receiving. And so, of course, I mean, the, the, the week starts to go, one meeting after another, next day, and the next day, and it was, it was a wrap-up time, getting close, and he's starting to think, like, I, I got to, like, I got this burning my hole in my pocket, and Pastor Jamie's going to ask me, and... Uh, he says, you know, the funniest thing that happened, I gave it to somebody I totally wouldn't think I would have got it, given it to. I had someone in my mind that I was thinking for whatever reasons, I was thinking that this probably is the person I'm going to bless, whether, you know, they were going through a difficult struggle or whatever. He says, but I was in a conversation with somebody, a pastor, a youth pastor, and we're just talking, nothing about, like, whether they have a job or don't have a job or whether they sold a house or don't have a house or, or whether their kids got medical, nothing like that, just chatting. And as we're chatting, it was like God just went, like, ding, ding, ding this guy. And he says, like it wasn't real arrows, but it was, you know, you're sitting there and all of a sudden like he just goes, him. And you're thinking, well, I was kind of thinking in my head, maybe someone else, but there's no obvious reason why I would say him. Maybe I'll wait a little longer, see if there's a real obvious one. Wasn't. So out of obedience, Pastor Call just said, hey, bud. Shook his hand, gave it to him, walked away. Got an email after. I remember him just reading a little bit to me and saying how much it meant. Give all the context. You didn't know this, but I'm without a job right now. My wife, is. she's been going through school, and we're having to transition. We've had to move, and things are really tough, and things are really tight. And he got all that after the obedience. Not before. Why is that important? Well, that's important because if it was before, that's information, not confirmation. When it happens after, that's confirmation. Some of you are waiting and you're saying, oh, I'm just waiting for confirmation. Well, you can't get confirmation before. Confirmation comes after. You have enough information to make the decision. So make the decision in faith believing that it's God guiding and then wait for the confirmation. He was, he was obedient, came back and shared it. And I share it for this. He goes, wow, I couldn't believe how much the experience was. It's the same way with God. He blesses us, and I, I, I hesitate because I don't want to make it. That's the only time I've ever done that. Well, that's, that's not true. I did one other time since then because it was such a good one. But uh, you just do it to be a blessing. You know, this last one, I was with Pastor Call as well. I'm just going to like, man, Pastor Call is, uh, but he was going to preach at a, at a at a retreat for another youth group, and God put on my heart a pastor for that youth group, and so I asked him to carry the gift, if you will, like the those that went to the, from the Macedonian church. And but but those are the only two times. And but I say it to say it came back, really spoke to me of how much it impacted his experience when we recognize what we've received that it's not ours. That that fifty bucks he had in his pocket was was not his 50 bucks. It was my 50 bucks. Given to him for a purpose to be a blessing in someone's life. And when we see what we have as a gift from God to be generous, it changes the way we see things. We come to church not seeing how we can get, but how can we bless somebody? Whether it's a spiritual gift, whether it's a talent, an ability, time, finances, job, we see our job, we see our vocation, we see our house, where we live, who we're beside. We see all of these things as a, as a gift from God to be able to use an opportunity to be a blessing for him to benefit the kingdom. All right, I went a little bit farther than I wanted to go on that one. Three times a year, it says in verse 16. Three times a year, all your men must appear, here's that mandate, before the Lord your God at the place he choose, he will choose, 
at the festival of unleavened bread, Passover, at the festival of weeks, Pentecost, uh, sorry, the festival of weeks, the first fruits, and the festival of tabernacles, no one should appear before the Lord empty handed. Wow. Three times a year, you must stand before God. And when you do, you must not stand before him open hand, empty-handed. God does want, not want a one-way relationship with us. We receive and we give. It's a healthy relationship. I'm not sure... Someone clean, covered over the, uh, the clock down the front with the Kleenex box. But uh, I'm going to get you done here ready in a second. But the, uh, we receive and we give. And a healthy relationship is, is giving on both sides. Uh, I can't get into a merit. Somebody's, yes. Thank you, Joan, for moving the Kleenex leg. Everybody else thanks you for letting me see the clock now, Joan. <laughs> Thanks, Joan. You're, you're a ministry there, the gift of helps right there. Thank you, Barb and Joan. They both decided it was sec- first and seconded over here for, for letting pastor see the time. The, um, you, a healthy relationship, I can't go into detail, but a healthy marriage, you make a deposit in each other's life. When it's one way, it's not healthy. When, when you need from the other person, when that's your focus, when I'm not getting from them, that's not healthy. The focus needs to be on you making sure you're depositing in their life, giving to them. They making sure they're giving to you. It's not healthy to say, I'm making sure I'm getting from you. And you're making sure you're getting from me. And then somehow we're balanced because we're equally making sure that we're getting enough. It's, it's willingly to generously, with great joy and celebration, reveling in the fact that you can be able to give, to make a deposit. Our relationship with God says it's not good if you just are there receiving from me all the time. You need to also serve and give, not because he lacks, but because it's a mark of a healthy relationship. And it gives you an opportunity to participate in the divine, the divine and to celebrate. Learning to give teaches about more than just finances. It keeps us on track. I'm so impressed with the church in Romania. I was reading an article the other day about how they don't have very much, but yet they continue to be a church that's generous and gives. They're only allowed to give 2.5% of their income to charitable organizations. It's not about that you can get a deduction. It's that you're actually not allowed to do anymore. And they're trying to figure out loopholes of how they can be able to give more to the work of God. <laughs> they, they have less. And they're looking for ways to be able to give more. And, and yet we live in a society where we have more. We can give as we please, and we try to find loopholes in the scripture to find out ways that we don't have to give as much. I just think it's off. And so I'm not saying I'm not going to give you percentages, I'm not going to give you amount, I'm not even going to do an offering today. But next week we'll give you an opportunity to serve God. And it's not going to be about you responding out of pressure, we'll do the things the same way we give them. But I just ask you to take inventory. What have you received? How has God blessed you? And wave it before him in celebration. I'm going to have the worship team come as we draw to a close and we give time for you to serve in communion and receive and celebrate. I mentioned before about this comparison between prosperity, legalism, and transformational giving. I'm halfway between reading my notes with my glasses on and my glasses off. Prosperity is a fortune motivation. Legalism is a fear motivation. You give or you'll be in trouble. And transformational is a faith motivation and a faith source. You give because you've recognized that you've received from God. 
and recognize that he is the one who provides. Verse 17, is expected and appropriate for God's people to give in proportion the way he blesses. Here's it again in verse 17. Each of you must give, must bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord your God has blessed you. Percentage here is not important. Giving as it's appropriate is proportionate. And sometimes 10% might be too small. Great lessons about faith and life. God wants us to be givers. Wants us to be generous. Most appropriate for those who lead God's people. When you start to take this in, and I pray you do, in just every way you do life, not just here in the building, I mean just everywhere you go. In a restaurant, you give a tip, be generous. You, I got my hair cut, I don't know if you noticed. I got my hair cut this week. I gave a gift and gave them more. Why? Well, because you're supposed to tip, and how much am I supposed to tip? 10, 15, you know what? I gave him more. More enough that he took it and he kind of went, said, thanks. Walk out. In the course of the conversation, of course, when I was in the chair, as any good barber does, so, what do you do? Right? I mean, that's it. I was uh, flip-flops, shorts, and a t-shirt on a Saturday after doing yard work. I'm a pastor. Really? Yeah, trying to get good for Sundays. And be generous. Whether it's with your neighbor, be generous. If we catch this, it's no wonder. Isn't it fitting that when God wanted to multiply spiritual blessing on the land at Pentecost... It was, it was Pentecost. It's of course that, it, that, that the harvest was increasing and thousands are added to the day because it was Pentecost. It's about harvest. And of course, it would, they would be people that in light of what God has done and blessed them, they're just generous with everything you had. Well, of course. Because, because that's, what, that's what God's people did at the Feast of Weeks and the Feast of Pentecost. It's fitting for us to be believers that would follow after him. Readiness to receive not just the material, but the spiritual blessings as well for his glory. It's actually appropriate. An individual or institution that refuses to commit to God in the material will not likely commit to him in the immaterial either. We talk about surrendering, giving God all. If we do not give to God in things that don't matter or things that are of material or temporary importance, if we don't give Him to what has temporary importance, we probably won't give to Him in the part that has immaterial or has eternal importance either. You know, I looked at the celebration. I've been a part of a couple of services when giving was a celebration. Most of them happened, ironically, in third world countries where people hardly have anything, but boy, did they ever have a hoot and holler when they were given. I mean, the biggest dance fest was on coming and give their offering. Great big laundry baskets, barely filling up the bottom of it. And the front. They'd play the music, and man, it was loudest when it was offering time. It's a great atmosphere. We're called to build the kingdom. God has blessed us for a mission. We're all co-workers in the kingdom. So, let's be generous. We have freely received, so it's only appropriate for us to freely give. As Pastor Sunil leads us in worship now, I invite you to reflect on how God has blessed you. Reflect on how he's blessed you through the cross. 
Reflect on how he's blessed you with the material as well as with the immaterial, with the natural as well as with the supernatural. Even as we're worshiping and singing, as you're receiving the emblems, reflect and thank him together.